Greetings. My name is Dr. David Matthew Walton, known by many as Kalanji, thus known by some as Dr. Kalanji. Welcome to my YouTube channel, True Black History and Actual Black Studies. And this lecture series is titled Introduction to Black History. So welcome, and I hope you enjoy. Introduction to Black History, Lecture Online. Today we will be discussing pre-colonial and pre-European contact Africa, which consists of the birth of modern man and early African civilizations. So, as we begin, Now, as we know, the birthplace of modern man, and modern man is Homo Homo sapien, is in the Great Lake regions of Africa, which consists of five nations, right? We have Rwanda, Burundi, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Uganda, and Tanzania. And we know this through mitochondrial DNA. What is mitochondrial DNA? It is passed down from mother to daughter. It is not passed down from father to son or mother to son, but passed down from mother to daughter. And the oldest human remains, intact human remains, thus allowing us to do bone marrow testing for DNA testing, we've discovered that the oldest Homo Homo sapien, the mitochondrial Eve, comes from the Great Lake regions of Africa. And then modern man migrated out of Africa to populate the world in several ways. What makes us look different? A very, very, very small percentage of DNA, less than 1%. But to the human eye, it seems so great, the differences, right? But they're so small when we look at the science, look at DNA, look at the human genome. The differences between eye color, skin pigmentation, height, shape of the body, male pattern baldness in my case, and etc. right? Less than 1% difference. Also, as humans migrated out of Africa, out of this tropical equatorial environment, right? They began to lose melanin. They began to lose pigmentation right? Meaning less melanin, because everyone has melanin, even if it's a small amount, right? And that was based upon the adapting to the new environments, right? That's what the science has told us, right? And we know how our skin, uh, deep melanation or rich melanation, as well as the hair, uh, the uh, what is the proper term? Uh, the types of hair, I guess, for lack of a better way to express it, right? So that the various types of hair that are what we would now consider indigenous to Africa, right? They all had health benefits for that environment, right? The ability to uh, take in and process and or repel, right? Uh, uh, rays coming from the sun, right? Right, that people go to the grocery store or go to the pharmacist and get skin cream and skin ointment to protect them from these waves, from these uh, rays, I should say, right? Because of skin cancer and all that. The ability to process vitamin D from the sun's rays, right? You know, through the hair and through the skin because of melanin. This is all scientifically proven. Right. In other environments, they needed changes in their physiology to be able to adapt and survive in those climates. Dr. Franz Cress Wellsling describes it, talking about the argument between nature versus nurture, right? And science has proven it to be true. In a tropical equatorial environment, right, you would need a wider nose because air is heavier, because it has more H2O to bring in 
the air to be able to breathe, for example, right? But that wide nose in Europe or in a uh, colder environment, right, would lead to what? Pneumonia. So adaptation of the narrowness of the nose. Like we see with the steep people in modern day so-called Manchuria, right? You know, you see they have shapes of their eyes that reflect what? Being able to see in the wind and to see uh, with the reflection of the sun of various stones, right? These are natural adaptations that we see physically and think that indicates a huge difference, but it truly, truly doesn't, right? So the original modern man, Homo, Homo sapien, was in Africa and migrated out of Africa, right? Now, why do I bring that up? It's not to imply anything beyond simply that there is truly only one race of human beings on the planet, and that is the human race known as modern man or homo, homo sapien, right? So the race, as we understand it today, is a social construct, right? But that doesn't mean it's not a true and real lived experience with real consequences, but it just does make us understand and reminds us that it is a social construct, right? Now, we've been misled, miseducated uh, because of white supremacy and Eurocentrism in the West, in our education system, in our popular culture, in our popular media, right? So we have been told that Africa had no civilizations prior to the coming of the European. That Africa had no history prior to the coming of the European. That Africa was inconsequential prior to the coming of the European. However, science proves that incorrect. Global history proves that incorrect, right? Primary sources proves that incorrect right so i want us to take a look at this map because now we're going to letter b roman numeral one letter b right civilizations pre-colonial pre-european contact african civilizations right all right so i want to pull up a map this is the map of ancient Egypt and Ethiopia, uh, Nubia, ancient Egypt and Nubia. Right. Now, when I got this map from Wadsworth, a division of Thompson Learning Inc., I got a whole book of slides, historical maps, I should say, that I use when I teach. And I got them from this company in 2005, and it was published in 2004. Now, Senegalese scholar, Sheikh Anta Diop, or in his native language, Jop, uh, published a book, and it's called uh, The African Origins of Civilization, Myth or Reality. Let's see if I have that book at the ready. I don't want to go digging for it because we are recording, and it doesn't look like I have it at the ready. Oh, I do. In fact. This is the book right here. And in this book, Dr. Dia proves what he framed as the Southern thesis of the origins of ancient Egypt, or as the ancient Egyptians themselves called it, ancient Kemet, right? Now, why is this important? Well, if you check any history book that uh, involves, or let me frame it this way, if you check any textbook that is dedicated to the history of Western civilization. So at the collegiate level, community college or the university level, if they take Western civilization one, right? It's usually a two part serial course. They are gonna start the history of Western civilization in Northeast Africa. They're actually gonna start in a place that is in modern day Ethiopia, 
and it is called axum. You see it right here, right? And then they're going to move to ancient Egypt. And then the story begins to be told about the development of civilization and what we call the Western world in Europe out of Egypt, right? And this has been documented by many, many scholars, right? And these scholars aren't necessarily African Americans, Africans, nor are they Afrocentrics or Black study scholars. They're just historians of the ancient world and they different phrases that uh, are used to describe them studying this geographic location, right? Many, and I want to identify two, and then I'm going to get back to Diop, are studies of Europe, uh, historians of Europe, right? Nonetheless. Martin Bernal talks about it in Black Athena. And this is Black Athena, the Afro-Asiatic Roots of Classical Civilization, Volume 1, The Fabrication of Ancient Greece, right? The Fabrication of Ancient Greece, right? And in it, he argues that ancient Greek and then i.e. Roman civilization, cosmology, theology, and et cetera, was actually borrowed and Hellenized and then Latinized Kemetic or Egyptian theology and cosmology and philosophy and mathematics and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Which shouldn't be surprising because in this book published in 500 BCE by Herodotus or Herodotus, depending on your preference of uh, pronunciation, it's called the history. Right, and it was published in 500 BCE. And Herodotus or Herodotus is viewed as the uh, father of history. To be more accurate, it would be the father of European or of Western history, but nonetheless, the father of history. And in that book, I believe it was book two, which would be the section two of that book, he describes at the time the physical features of the Egyptians or the Kemetics. Right. He describes them in what we would contemporarily say African features, black features, uh, negroid, mongoloid, in all those derogatory terms that used to be accepted in the social science about 100 years ago, 150 years ago, 200 years ago, right? When they created white, when they uh, codified it in science, white supremacy, right? Nonetheless, he just talks about the trial of uh, uh, Socrates, right? And he talks about how Socrates was on trial for introducing foreign ideas to the Greek elite children, the boys, right? Because he was a teacher, right? These North East African ideals, nonetheless, also, he discusses or describes how the ancient Greeks viewed ancient Egypt as what? The valley of the gods, the bringers of civilization, right? He describes it, right? So this is in 500 BCE, 500 years before the birth of Christ or BCE secularized before the common era, right? So it is acknowledged that ancient Egypt contributed to the development of civilization in the Western world, in Europe, to Greece, then Greece to Rome, and et cetera, et cetera, right? But what Dia introduced to us, proving what they said, and Bernard came along, Bernard came along after him, and the white scholars rejected them and black people that need white people to validate it rejected it because they didn't read the book. I mean, this book, the evidence he used, oh my God, he was a chemist. He was a linguist. He was a historian. He was an anthropologist. Yes, yes. And he used all those skills, right? Nonetheless, right? He argued what's called the Southern Thesis, right? And that is that a culture from here, 
migrated north and introduced their culture there. Ask them. And now we go back to what I said. If you take a Western civilization course, they are going to start in Axum, modern day Ethiopia, right? This isn't no secret. They teach this at colleges and universities. Perhaps if you took a Western civilization course in high school, they told you this in high school as well. Perhaps you weren't paying attention. Perhaps you were suspended. Perhaps the, the teacher didn't or professor didn't frame it in a way where you can make them connections. Uh, I, I don't know, but it's no secret, right? It is, it is not a secret at all, right? Now this map, the map of ancient Egypt, right? Of ancient Egypt and the Nile. So we focus in here and then you say, see ancient Egypt, right? See Palestine there, right? Much of Palestine, the Gaza Strip, Sinai and all that is now part of the contemporary nation state of Israel. However, as you can see, they're right next to North Africa. It is impossible that anybody from this community, from this region, from this area, look like a blonde haired, blue eyed person. That look like a brown haired, blue eyed person. They will be North African as we understand it today meaning that they will be either Arabic or Persian, right? Or Semitic. They will not be European and they will not look like Europeans. Nonetheless, and much of the Bible takes place in these areas. That's another discussion, which is something for you to consider. Nonetheless, the Nile River runs upward. That's because most maps that we look at, including the maps I have here, are upside down, and they were presented that way to promote white supremacy, to displace Africa, to make Europe look as the center of the earth, to make Europe look larger than what it is, right? Nonetheless, so we see the river runs up, starting here in Nubia. Remember the last slide? And now it breaks up and splits into what? The blue, the blue now and the white now that what has tributaries going into Central Africa. Mm. Connecting in a waterway of allowing travel from Central Africa to the Nile Delta, right? But nonetheless, at this part that we're looking at here, right? You can see how easy it will be for people to move up. Now, Egypt is in a desert. And the Nile River would flood. And then when it retracted, that soil would be very, 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 very rich, arid land, right? And then we get down here, right? You see a lot of rich land starting here, right? Starting right around what? Nubia, right? Green, arable land, right? This is where our map here, this box here, here ends, right? So leading right up to what? Axum, moving on up. Right. Now, this is the Mediterranean Sea. So this is the Mediterranean region. This is parts of Europe right here, right? And if we was going on the other side, but we're not there yet. We're just focusing right here and now, right? And we have the Arab Peninsula, right? So you could say in many ways that although we're talking about pre-European contact, when we're talking about parts of Africa, particularly the Mediterranean region, you can't say a pre-European contact, just like you can't say a pre-African contact or pre-Arab or pre-Asian contact, right? They have been in contact since man first migrated to this region and developing and sharing ideas, right? That's how the Greeks would be traveling here and interacting here and back and forth and all the knowledge being exchanged, right? That's important. Now, this is a map of the emergence of African states. These are large centralized societies, right? As you can see, this is the emergence, early states in their spheres of influence, right? You have a lot of decentralized societies 
but you have the emergence of centralized societies, right? We have what in West Africa, right? Ghana, Shanghai, House of City States, Benin, right? And then later, the Almoravid Empire, a Muslim empire, right? Obviously, we have Egypt, Nubia, right? But Axum, these are the early ones. Axum, see, before Egypt. See, see, they ain't put nothing there. The House of States before. Right? Just think about that. Right? Congo, the B Congolese Empire, Great Zimbabwe. So we have Southern Africa, Central Africa, Eastern Africa, Western Africa. Right? So all over the continent. All over the continent. Now, this is a map of Africa 900 to 1500 AD, leading up to European contact in Sub-Saharan Africa, right? First, you see Timbuktu. You might have heard of Mali, you might have heard of Mansa Musa, Timbuktu, right? The area of Ghana, Mali, and the Shanghai states, right? So you see that group large, right? Then you have the House of City states that may have shrank, but Benin group, Kumasi, right? Aksum, Nubia, right? You have Maasai along here, right? So you know, might be heard of Mogadishu, Black Hawk Down, right? Kilwa, Malindi, Mombasa, right? You have Great Zimbabwe, right? And then you also have what? The movement of Bantu peoples, right? All the way up to the 1800s, right? They started migrating from this part of Western Africa over and then down, right? So we see these migrations, right? Now, let's discuss the spread of Islam. Now, why is this important? Well, because, one, many people think then, before European contact, it was the coming of Islam that brought civilization to Africa. Now, that is equally problematic as the Eurocentric notion that it was white people. This one is just an Arab or Persian-centered uh, farce, right? that wants to rob Africa of its heritage, to be quite honest with you, right? So we see here, right, this is the spread of, the, of Islam. So I put this on here so you can see that in Africa, right? So starting in North Africa, right, 632. This is after Muhammad, I mean, the time of Muhammad, right? You know, so what are we talking about? A.D., after the death of Christ, or the common era, right? So this is very recent. And then into further south, into West Africa in parts of East Africa, right? 750, 1200. Very, very recent. Very, very recent. So people get confused and they say things like, Islam is the true religion of the black man. <sighs> Not so much, but I'll put an asterisk by it. At the time of the advent of the Atlantic slave trade, when many of those West Africans were enslaved, traded, or as a result of war, prisoners of war were traded. So they were traded either way into the Atlantic slave trade, into Atlantic slavery. So you can see someone, right, in 1558 saying, our true religion is Islam. Our original religion is Islam. Yes, because their community had been practicing it for 500 years, a half a millennia, right? So yes, they could feel that way, right? But that wouldn't be what people have taken and made it to seem. What it says is, before I was forced into Atlantic slavery and not allowed to practice my worldview, my spiritual belief systems, I, we were Muslim, right? But not all of Africa. In fact, you can see Islam would not spread further than here. Now I go to South Africa quite frequently. The only Muslims in South Africa are Indians from India, right? Asians of various persuasions who were Muslims, 
right? And Nigerian immigrants and other various Persian and Arab immigrants. The indigenous people in South Africa, they are not Muslims, never have been. Never have been, right? You say, why is this important? Well, we'll get to that in later lectures, but I want to say that those of us in the Americas who are products of the Atlantic slave trade, we came from the entire continent. When they said West Africa, y'all got it confused. They meant the West Coast of Africa. From the top to the Cape of Good Hope. From, the, from Morocco to modern day South Africa, Cape Town, South Africa the entire west coast of africa we come from the entire continent the entire continent right now going back to this right. we'll use this map that's fine enough, right so this is the influence of islam right here this is what we're talking about all this no 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 nope you had some over here you had some even along the coast here because of the ottoman empire and the silk world the, you know but yes no the majority vast vast no right now africa is technically the second largest continent to eurasia Right. Because of white supremacy, Eurocentrism, you know, Europe want to be separate from Asia, so they'd be like, Europe, then Asia. But Africa is the second largest continent, second to Eurasia, right? We're talking about thousands of ethnicities, thousands of cultures, thousands of languages, right? You had centralized and decentralized society. Centralized societies would be a society with what we would determine to be a strong central government. Decentralized would be a collection of localized societies who each make decisions on their own, but they are connected through ethnic or kinship ties, right? Uh, you have sedimentary and migratory societies. Sedimentary is those who stay in one fixed location. Migratory is those who migrate. They may have a fixed migratory pattern based upon their culture's needs. So it could be a one-year cycle, a five-year cycle, a 10-year cycle, and et cetera. They could be following wild game. They could be following fishing patterns. They could just move around migratory because that's what their culture had dictated. Uh, it could be for trade, right? It, whatever was the needs of those communities, right? Larger centralized societies, obviously by default, will be what? Sedimentary. Most smaller, not most, but many smaller decentralized societies were migratory, right? They moved around, right? So there is no one fixed way to say, oh, African civilization is. African civilizations are. It's, it's very difficult, near impossible. To do that now you can find some commonalities and highlight them but you can't present it in any in essentialistic way right the who when and where matters right who what africans when when are we talking about where where were they at because migration and things of that nature right all of those things certainly matter the who when and where right but the important thing to note is that there were African civilizations prior to European contact in Sub-Saharan Africa, prior to the arrival of Europeans in Sub-Saharan Africa, right? We're talking early 1500s when the first Europeans arrived in South, uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa. <laughs> that is recent, very recent, right? And we have these civilizations that, these large centralized civilizations that existed way before that, that the Europeans themselves acknowledge, right? That, them, that, them, that they themselves acknowledge, right? In their own history books, right? 
They're not hiding anything. See, y'all looking under the bushes for spooks because you don't want to read a book. But I'm not going to scold you. That's why I'm doing these videos, right? To help you understand, right? To give you a foundation. It's just an introductory, right? And it, it, it's not going to make you an expert, <laughs> but nonetheless. But in summary, once again, we've established that they were thriving, thriving, pre-colonial, pre-European contact African civilizations, some of which Asia, the Arab world, the Persian world, and Europe were intimately aware of, that show up in their histories and in their literature. Right. Awesome. Well, thank you for watching this first video of the Introduction to Black History Lecture Series. And this mini lecture was titled Pre-Colonial and Pre-European Contact Africa. Thank you. Please like, share, and subscribe. And definitely leave a comment, ask questions, tell me if you enjoyed it, and look forward to the second lecture, which will be coming soon, which will be the African Worldview the pre-European contact, the pre-colonial African world view. Thank you. And once again, my name is Dr. David Matthew Walton, known to many as Dr. Kalanji. Peace and chicken grease.